She's just been having an argument with Gabe. She thinks he might be trying to steal her skateboard. She's pretty upset about that. She loves her skateboard. Uh, and, uh, and in order to get away from the storm, they continue their argument by stepping through this, into this, uh, into this little um, dark area through this rocky windowsill. The darkness was absolute and wrong. It took Darby a minute or two to figure out the wall of noise from the storm had stopped the instant they stepped inside, just like someone had slammed a door on it. Darkness dropped around her like a smothering black hood. She couldn't feel Gabe's hand. She couldn't see any light. The panic that she felt rising was, with the onset of the storm, threatened to erupt. She thought things were bad when the darkness was on the other side of the bedroom door, but that had been nothing. Reaching for Gabe, she spun in a circle. Nothing. Waving her arms wildly, she tripped and fell, her head rebounding off the floor. It seemed to Darby that the darkness had taken not only her vision, but also her voice. Or maybe she was just too scared to scream. One minute she'd been yelling at Gabe over the noise of the storm, and the next, finally she just covered her eyes with her hands, wanting to make her own darkness and not having it pushed down on her against her will. For some reason, this seemed to work. When she got up the courage to uncover her eyes, thin daylight outlined the stone frame of the window. The rain had stopped too. Instead, mist rose up from the ground in a ghostly shimmer that was almost scarier than the storm itself. It slipped along the rock window and rolled over the sill like foam frothing over a waterfall. The already dim light of the outbuilding took on a gray tone she didn't like at all. And where was Gabriel, anyway? Uh, Gabe? I, I don't feel like playing hide and seek, okay? She said. Her voice sounded squeaky and, and scared to her own ears. She shifted a bit to one side and rolled up on her toes to see if visibility was any better higher up. It wasn't. Her stomach twisted into a knot. Trust your instincts, her mother always said. If the situation feels wrong, it probably is. Okay, this is just stupid. Stupid and embarrassing. Her voice sounded small and wavering, but at least she still had a voice. Enough was enough. It was time to get scarce. I'll be back tomorrow for my skateboard, she yelled into the misty room, and I'll be bringing my brother and he's really big. As soon as the words came out of her mouth, Darby cringed. An imaginary big brother? It had been a long time since she'd hauled him out. It must have been a couple of years, at least. One time she'd run all the way home from school because some kids had stolen her bus pass. My big brother will get you, she yelled as she bolted onto Young Street. The kids just laughed. Probably the way Mr. Gabe the Mysterious was laughing right now, wherever he was. I'd better get that skateboard back, she muttered to herself. The mist had thickened so much she had to put her hands out to feel the rocky surface of the window ledge. Bad enough to lose the skateboard. She didn't want the stormy evening to catch her in the creepy old building. Nan would never let her out again. But something was wrong. More than wrong. Weird. The stone windowsill had been right behind her. She just hopped over it. She could feel the spot where a sharp piece of rock had bitten into her palm as she climbed up onto it. Darby reached an arm straight out to feel for the window. Nothing. She shuffled her feet to one side about a foot. Still nothing. The wall should be there. I should have bumped into it by now or at least grazed my knuckles. She moved sideways again. Oh, come on, she said aloud. First the storm and now the fog. What was with the weather in this place? But she freaked out once and she wasn't about to do it again. Still, the fog had her completely turned around. Stepping carefully so as not to trip again, she flung her arms out wide and slid her feet side to side. The only sound was her own breathing. Finally, when she was ready to scream, her hand brushed something. Not a rock windowsill. This surface was cold. So cold, she yanked her head away, hand away in surprise. In the second or two it took her to get up the nerve to reach out again, the temperature fell sharply. Darby's breath felt like ice crystals on her lips. Ice crystals? In summer? What was happening? She took a panicky step forward, and sure enough, she bumped her head. Hard. Hard enough to knock her to her knees. And just as her knees hit the ground, they crunched. Darby figured out that the crunch was not breaking bones, but rather the sound of frozen snow on the ground, and she finally got what she had been waiting for. A light shone through the mist at last. With the snow under her knees came a realization. She must have fallen asleep. There was no way this would be anything but a dream. The kind of dream where you find yourself in a place you've never been before, and yet it's somehow familiar. That had to be the explanation. There she was, on her hands and knees, in some kind of crunchy snow in the middle of summer, wisps of fog whirling and fading all around. The only thing to do was to head for the beam of sunlight that gleamed like a beacon ahead. The sun grew brighter, and the air was suddenly sparkling like prisms. Pretty painful on the eyes, but Darby had never been so happy to see daylight in her life. 
She crawled as fast as she could toward the source of the light. If there was a record for the fastest crawl through the snow and cutoffs, Darby was determined to break it. The strangely glittering ceiling suddenly dropped, but after two head bumps in as many minutes, she ducked down and headed straight for the light. By the time Darby got the nerve to lift her head again, she realized she'd crawled nearly 20 feet past the end of whatever weird tunnel she'd been in. And when she looked up, she wished she hadn't. Around her was a world of white. The sky was white, the ground was white. Darby had never seen so many shades of white. From blindingly bright, almost blue white to a dull, flat white that pounded at her temples like visual static. Everything was white, nothing was white, everything was nothing. She could not identify a single object. She staggered to her feet, one hand over the sore spot above her left eyebrow. First total darkness and then this? The whole dream scenario just wasn't making sense. This all white world had to be the result of the knocks she'd given her skull over the past five minutes. Darby remembered the time she'd smacked her head on the curb when she first tried out the skateboard. That had been kind of like this. She rubbed the sore spot again. Okay, the truth was that nothing had ever really been like this, but the sense that her brain no longer quite belonged in her body was the closest feeling she ever had to this sensation. That time, after the stars had cleared, her mother had plopped a helmet on her head and everything had been all right again, apart from the headache that lasted a day or two. But now there was no lecturing, helmet-bearing mother. There was no warm summer evening. Instead, there was cold. Deep, deep cold. Darby had a sudden longing for one of Nan's geeky hand-knit sweaters. She touched her, he her head again. It throbbed a bit, but didn't feel so bad, really. She took a quick look at her fingers, too. No blood. And yet everything was still white. She hugged herself tightly, tucked a hand under each arm, and thought about the light. It had been a white light at the end of a tunnel. A chill penetrated her heart with the speed of a slicing icicle. Didn't people claim to see a white light just before they died? She wiggled her eyebrows. Sure, there was no blood on the outside, but what if all this was a hallucination brought on by bleeding in her brain? Am I dead? She whispered, and then she jumped a little at the sound of her own voice. She hadn't meant to speak aloud, but the fact that she had had to mean that she wasn't dead. Didn't it? You're not dead, Darby. The voice, so close to her ear, made her jump again. It was Gabe. Darby felt faint with relief. She spun around. Where are you? She hissed, and then it became because she really wanted to know. Where am I? You'll see me soon enough. Just be patient. Watch for the helping hand. What kind of an answer was that? Darby made a mental, mental note to find someone new to hang out with. Even Gramps was less weird than this guy. Gabe? No response. She could have kicked herself for not listening more closely to the location of his voice. Or maybe reasoning with him would work. Or, or bribery. Hey, Gabe, look, just take the skateboard if you want it. Maybe that was a bad idea. She'd die for that skateboard. On the other hand, she remembered the light in the tunnel. The board is yours, Gabe. Just get me out of here, wherever here he is, okay? No response, but as though born on the wind from a long way off, she heard the unmistakable sound of his laugh. And at last, a figure materialized out of the wall of white around her. A small figure in what looked like a brown hoodie walked toward Darby with an awkward, wide-legged stance. So it turns out that Darby is in, has made it through her first time travel experience and is in this world where no one can see her or touch her. But strangely enough, they seem to be able to smell her. And uh, she's walking through the snow. She's lost one of her flip-flops. She's in her cut off and her and her bare feet, one bare foot, one, one with a flip-flop. And she is really cold. But she's not freezing to death. It seems really strange. She, you know, if she was if she was in the middle of a snowstorm in Toronto in the middle of winter with one flip-flop, she figures she'd last about three minutes. And this is in the high Arctic, and she's not freezing to death. So it's it's very, very interesting. She doesn't know why. Suddenly she sees a small group of people coming at a distance, and they are moving very fast. Suddenly, Darby heard a shout. Gabe and his group. She looked up to see them hurrying back across the snowy plain, followed at some distance behind by a bounding yellowish dog. They hadn't taken 10 more steps when Darby realized that that animal was as much a dog as she was a chicken. Bear! She screamed, jumping up and down and pointing. Gabe and one of the other group members were supporting a tiny person, no bigger than the little girl she met earlier, Shahaji. How are they moving so fast? Darby had no idea, but they were not moving as fast as the bear. Thinking about it afterwards, she was pretty sure it wasn't a full-grown polar bear. She'd looked them up in the encyclopedia, and she knew they could grow to be eight feet tall on their hind legs. 
The one chasing Gabe in his group was not eight feet tall, but he was plenty big enough. He had a kind of bumbly running style, and at one point he actually stopped chasing the group and rolled for a minute in the snow, like he was playing. Gabe and the people with him didn't stop to watch, though. They were pretty close now, and she could see the strain on their faces as they tried to make it back to the tunnel ahead of the bear. As they staggered up, Gabe and one other guy in the group half pushed, half carried the tiny person toward the entrance to the tunnel. Darby turned to see Sha'achi's little face framed in the opening. Nukum, she squealed. That means grandma. Nanook, corrected the old lady, for Darby could now see this must be the missing grandmother. Inside, she commanded, and Sha'achi's face disappeared as the others thrust Nukum into the black tunnel and scrambled in after her. And in what had to be the strangest moment of Darby's entire life, she turned to find herself face to face with a polar bear. Now Darby had done her share of school reports on Canada's mammals. In grade five, she did a huge project on the Kodiak, a very large type of grizzly bear found in the north. She distinctly recalled writing in her report that Kodiak bears were the biggest bears in Canada, even bigger than polar bears. Standing on his hind legs, this guy was the biggest thing she'd ever seen. Seconds before, she'd been terrified of plunging back into that black tunnel, but it was amazing how the close-set eyes of a polar bear gazing at her changed her mind. The bear bounded up to the spot where the snow was flattened and suddenly stopped. With careful steps and a rolling gait, he moved toward the tunnel, shaking his massive head back and forth as he walked. Down on all fours, she noticed he was a little pigeon-toed, but the size of his paws soon drove anything resembling a clear thought out of her mind. They looked as big as frying pans with claws as big as, well, as big as any claws she had ever seen. He paused to one side of the tunnel, and his, with his body directly between the snowdrift where Darby was standing and the tunnel. In a moment, he was towering over her, standing on his back paws and full out leaning on the top of the snow house behind the tunnel. The fur on his belly was pure white, or at least a little y less yellow than the rest of him against the white ice of the snow house. She could actually see where his skin was almost black under the thick layer of fur. A black that seemed to emerge only with his sharp nose and again with his tiny eyes. At that point, she thought he might roar or rip the top of the house off and devour the inhabitants like a giant frozen people pot pie or turn and swallow her whole. But he did none of these things. Instead, he looked around in a nearsighted manner and with his mouth open, noisily sniffed the air. Darby stood frozen to the spot. Was it possible the bear hadn't seen her? A creature this size had to have an awesome sense of smell. If he hadn't seen her, then surely he could smell her now. It would only be a matter of seconds before she became a nice, light snack. He did see Darby. Saw her and smelled her. She knew he did because he swiveled his head around and he looked right into her face. He closed his mouth, made a kind of sing-song noise, half groan, half breathing, and then he tucked one shoulder under and rolled over into the snow kicking his legs joyfully in the air like a dog asking for a belly rub. He rolled again, this time onto his feet, and lumbered around to the back of the snow house. Suddenly, the power of movement returned, and before she could think about it twice, Darby dove into the tunnel.